Hey, if you've got a, a collection of ancient documents there that we call a Bible, just out of interest, how many people bring an actual Bible to church anymore? Just wondering. That's okay. Not, not a lot of people do anymore, do they? Um, but yeah, that's right. But lots of people now, you've got it on your phone or your tablet or whatever. Um, just a reminder, Rob, because I just saw you pull your phone out. You are directly in the line of sight. I remember the first week that we started live streaming our services and uh, somebody brought up their, their uh, phone and that night assumed, well, you must be looking at the Word of God. And then I went home to have a look at it because we'd never live streamed before. just wanted to see what it looked like. And uh, here they were on Facebook during the service. So uh, if you're anywhere here, just do the right thing, eh? Otherwise, big brother's watching. Big brother's watching. You're going to get caught out. Um, if you have a collection of ancient documents there that we call the Bible, can you turn with me this morning to Romans chapter 12? Romans chapter 12. Uh, for the next three weeks, I want to just take us down a, a bit of a path and get us to think about a few things and so on. And um, I love getting up here to preach after somebody gets up and does a communion message, which happens so often here. And I'm listening to the communion message and I'm going, oh, wow, there's a theme here today, God. This is, it's, 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 it's almost like God, it must be God, because you're speaking something to her, and then you speak something to me, and it kind of ties in. I love getting up on the back of that, and this morning is one of those uh, uh, moments, and hopefully it'll make a bit of sense as we sort of go along here. So let me just quickly pray. Father God, I pray, would you open our ears to hear what we need to hear from the Holy Spirit this morning? God, open our eyes, each of us, to see what we individually need to see from the Holy Spirit this morning. And Father, would you take us another step deeper into intimacy with you and into the fullness of this thing that we call the Christian life. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, this week, I read a news article this week, and you, you may have read, that, read this article too. I'm just trying to find uh, where I started on this thing here. But I read an article this week about Elon Musk. Who knows Elon Musk? Yep, pretty wealthy dude and, you know, all sorts of things going on, and Tesla. And, um, he's got this, this company called Neuralink. And this week I read an article where Neuralink, what they've done is they've created this little computer chip type thing. Anyone read this story? And they have been able to deposit that, what they're doing, they, they've, they've done the first trial where they've placed this chip in the brain of a person uh, that has uh, restricted movement, can't move. And the idea is that this chip, putting this chip in the brain, means that they will be able to control an iPad or a phone or some piece of technology purely by thinking, purely by the power of thought. So, so this thing goes in, now, and, and they, they will think of ringing somebody or think of, of writing something, and just somehow, I don't, I'm not a, I don't know how the technology works, but it goes in there, and they think it, and then all of a sudden, that, that, you know, they're ringing you, or they're writing something, or they're turning a page on a screen or something. At its best, at its best, when I, I, I heard about this, I jumped online, I did a bit of research, and I read, and, and here's what, what people are saying in uh, uh, technology and science and that. At its best, this chip will enable severely physically disabled individuals to control devices via thought, right? I want you to picture, like, the Force, all you Star Wars fans, the Force, you know? Ever seen that Star Wars movie? You know? Uh, there's nothing wrong with him. Oh, there's nothing wrong with him. Oh, you're... And they just, by thinking, you control people. So at its best, it's going to give these people the ability through their thoughts to control devices. Now, at its worst, because there's always a shadow side to everything, at its worst, implanting this chip can lead to brain infections and brain inflammation, as well as an increased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease later in life. So putting this thing in their brain can be either a really, really positive thing, but it could also be a really, really negative thing. Now, when I read this earlier in the week, it reminded me of the importance and power of what we allow to be placed into our minds. And while nobody in this room, I'm, I'm hoping and praying, nobody in this room is ever going to get a Neuralink brain chip put in, here's a fact. You are going to have, on average, today alone, 60,000 different thoughts. Did you know that? The average person on the average day has 60,000 thoughts run in your mind. Play around up there. Dance around in your brain. Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, he said this once. And you've probably heard this one. He said, sow a thought, reap an action. So sow a thought, think about something long enough, and you will what? You will live it out. You'll do it. Sow a thought, reap an action. He said, sow an action, you'll reap a habit. You do an action repetitively enough, that action becomes a habit. And he says, then sow a habit, you'll reap a character. Because a person that does this repetitively is a certain type of person. 
So you sow a habit, you reap a character. And then he said, if you sow a character, you reap a destiny. You reap a destiny. That, that character will take you to a certain place. You will reap a destiny. What's interesting is, if you sow a thought, he, he puts the connection here. He says, it starts with a thought, but it ends with a destiny. And such is the power of our thoughts. Such is the power of that which we allow to go into our mind. According to Emerson, he says, you are going to arrive tomorrow at the place where your thoughts take you today. Think about that. You're going to land tomorrow where your thoughts are taking you today. And I don't mean a literal tomorrow and a literal today. But I mean somewhere down the track there, you're going to land somewhere that's going to be determined by the thoughts that you allow to take root in your mind right now. The things you dwell upon, the things you think about. They're taking you somewhere. Craig Rochelle, Pastor Craig Rochelle, he words it this way, and I like the way he words it. He says, our life is always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. Our life is always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. And in case anybody's tempted to think, hey, this is just a new age thing, we're talking about thought control, I'm I'm not talking about that, it's not a new age thing. One of the greatest pieces of theological work ever written is the book of Romans. Anyone ever read the book of Romans? Yep. The book of Romans is an amazing book. Uh, French theologian John Calvin, he said about the book of Romans, he said, understanding Romans opens a pathway to understanding the whole Bible. Romans is the most concise, well thought out and well planned uh, description of the Christian faith, the what's and the why's, that you'll find anywhere else. Martin Luther said that Romans is the chief part of the New Testament. He considered it the most important document. If you had nothing else in the New Testament, he said, have Romans. So this is the most uh, well-respected piece of theological uh, writing that the church has at its disposal. And in Romans chapter 12, the chief writer, Paul, after the first 11 chapters of explaining the Christian life and the, and, and the, the whys and the hows and so on, in Romans chapter 12, he says this, He says, do not conform, verse 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, don't be conformed to this world. He says, be transformed into something else. And he says, you're going to be conformed in the ways of the world if you allow the ways of the world to dominate what goes in your mind. But he says the solution and the way that we're transformed, and he's writing to believers. He's saying the way that you are transformed, he says you've got to renew your mind. He says as you renew your mind, because it starts up here, sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. It starts up here. And so he says to these people, in light of all this stuff that God has done for you, uh, what, what he's, the, the doors he's opened up for you, the freedom he's given you, the life he's given you, the opportunity, the invitations he's handing to you, in light of all that, if you're going to walk into all that, he says, here's your starting point. You've got to renew your mind. How many of you, does anybody here know, or maybe you're this person, you came to faith in Christ, you had that explosion of joy, the Spirit came in, it was awesome, it was wonderful. But then as time went on, you realize, but hang on, but I'm kind of still the same person. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm transformed in ways like my, my, my spirit has been renewed. The Holy Spirit's inside of me, but I'm acting and living out still the same stuff. I'm responding to things the same way as I did before I came to faith. Anyone relate to that? Well, we think just because I said a sinner's prayer that everything is changed. You know what? I gave my life to Christ at 19, Right? My body stayed the same. Now, I wanted to be like an Adonis-type figure with huge biceps and so on. My spirit was renewed. I was filled with the Spirit of God. I was transformed, changed. I was taken, as Colossians says, from the kingdom of darkness, placed into the kingdom of light. But my physical body didn't change. It didn't change. Spiritually, I was in a new place, but my physical body was in the same place. I've got to do some things, don't I, to look after my body. I've still got to eat right and exercise and so on. Just because we get saved didn't mean that every single thing suddenly dropped off and we were perfect. We're not. Paul says the thing that we've got to do if we want to transform, uh, if we want our lives to be transformed, he says it starts in the space of the mind. It starts with your thoughts. And he says, here's what you're going to do. If you don't take control of the thoughts that you put in there, then the world will. The world will put things, the world will put 60,000 thoughts in your head. 
And if you just let them run around and don't think about them, don't, don't, don't manage them, then he said those thoughts are going to cause you to conform to something. You're going to conform to either the image of the world or you're going to be transformed into the image of God. But we have a role to play. And Paul says, here's all this great information, and this is 100% true, but here's the thing. You are going to have to learn to renew your mind if you want to be transformed into all that God wants you to be. You can make your life or you can break your life simply by the way you think. You can make your life or you can break your own life simply by the patterns of thought that you allow yourself to adopt, the thoughts that you allow to take root in the soil of your mind, that you fertilize, that you water, that you dwell upon, that you then begin to believe, that you then begin to believe out, whether they're true or not. A complete lie can suddenly become completely true to you because you dwelled on it so long, even though it's a complete lie. Even though it's a complete lie. Here's an example of making or breaking your life. In 2 Samuel chapter 10, we've got this uh, situation where the, the king of the Ammonites has died. And David decides, because of the friendship that he had with the king of the Ammonites and, and how the king of the Ammonites had shown some favor to David. Now, we don't have, the Old Testament doesn't give us a complete picture of exactly how this happened. But the assumption is when you put a few verses together that the Ammonite king, Nahash, he was anti Israel. He was going up against Israel. And David, of course, was a part of Israel. But at some point, you remember the story where Saul decides, I'm going to kill David, and David runs off. And all of a sudden, he's got some support coming from other places that hated Israel, not because they loved David, but because they hated Israel. And Saul was anti-David, so David's fleeing. We see the same scenario later on in, in, in the Old Testament, where David's own son, Absalom, Decides to sneakily try to take the throne away from his father and David flees from his own son Absalom and the same thing. There are these people that come to support David and to help David, not necessarily because they love David, but because they hate Israel. So they're supporting David because all of a sudden David is also an enemy of Israel and so on. And we have a few verses in the Old Testament that tie this together. So most theologians assume that it was during those periods of life, that was when the king Nahash of the Ammonites, that's when he supported David. So when, when the king, when Nahash dies, David goes, what can I do to show some kindness to Nahash's son Hanun? What can I do? I want to do something for him. And so in the course of time, the king of the Ammonites died and his son Nahum Hanum succeeded him as king. I better put my glasses on. And David thought, I will show kindness to Hanon, son of Nahash, just as his father showed kindness to me. So David sent a delegation to express his sympathy to Hanon concerning his father. Now when David's men came to the land of the Ammonites, the Ammonite commanders said to Hanon their lord, do you think David is honoring your father by sending envoys to you to express sympathy? Why were they saying that to him? Well, because the envoys of David had arrived. They'd already clearly communicated, we are here, express sympathy to you. That's how they knew it. Because they had arrived and said, hey, we're here, David sends his sympathies. But these commanders get in the king's ear, the new king's ear. He says, do you really think David's honoring your father by sending envoys to you to express sympathy? Hasn't David sent them to you only to explore the city, spy it out, and to overthrow it? So all of a sudden, Hanon's faced with these two thoughts. David's there going, his men, men are there saying, we've come here to express sympathy. And then all of a sudden his commanders come along and go, don't, that's not true. Reminds me, reminds me a bit of the Garden of Eden, doesn't it? God says, you know, this is life. You can eat of any tree, just not that one. And the devil comes along and he sort of throws another thought out there. And, 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 and mankind goes, oh, we'll, we'll feed on that thought. They sowed a thought, they reaped an action. And they certainly reaped a destiny. We're all living as a part of that. So David came to comfort the king. The Ammonite commanders planted different thoughts in the king's mind. And instead of embracing the, 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 the uh, compassion of David, instead of embracing the kindness of David, Hanon started a war, literally. He literally started a war. It says, Hanon seized David's envoys, shaved off half of each man's beard, cut off their garments at the buttocks and sent them away. He started a war. And in the end, that war, it cost Hanon his life. Isn't that a sad story? David literally came to, to comfort him. That was the truth. These guys plan another thought, and he has an option, he has a choice. Which thought are you going to believe? Are you going to believe what these men have said, or are you going to believe these commanders? And we get faced with that every day, don't we? Are you going to believe this truth, or are you going to believe that truth? 
Are you going to allow this thought to take root in your mind, or are you going to allow this thought? Are you going to fertilise and, and water uh, this particular thought about you, about your family, about the world around you, about God? Or, you, or is there a, this other truth over here? Which one are you going to choose? Because the choice is yours. You can go to Numbers chapter 13 and 14. It is one of the saddest stories in the Bible. Numbers 13 and 14. The entire 2 million people, approximately 2 million people come out of Egypt. They're ready to go into the promised land. God says to Moses, send 12 spies in there. Tell them to go on in and check out the land and so on. That I am giving to you. It wasn't, he didn't say, go and have a look and see if you think you're good enough to take it. He said, go and have a look at the land I am giving to you. Ironclad, sealed guarantee. I think after you've walked out of Egypt with all the spoils, after you've seen the Red Sea parted, you walked across, you saw all the Egyptian army drowned, after all that, surely you're starting to think, okay, maybe God's got this covered. Maybe I can trust this God. But it doesn't matter how many miracles you see, it's still a choice. Amen? It's still a choice. Feelings come and feelings go. And so they decide to send 12 spies in. The 12 spies come back. Now, here's the thing. The 12 spies come back, and 10 spies say, you know what, the land, there's giants there, and there's this, there's that. Now, don't be too hard on the 10 spies. I always hear people go, the 10 spies were bad. No, 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 go back and listen to what Moses asked the spies to do. When they came back, what they reported, they just, they actually reported what Moses asked them to report. But they get up there, and they say all this stuff, and then they add a couple of their own sort of perceptions, you know. We were like grasshoppers in their eyes. How do you know that? Did you walk up to him and say, hey, how do you see us? Oh, you look like a grasshopper. <laughs> no, no, you didn't go near him. You stayed away. You looked at him from a distance. How do you know? How do you know how they saw you? How do you know? That's coming from somewhere else. And you're believing it. Yeah. And so they go back and 10 spies go, you know, we, we, we can't do this. It's grrr. And we all know the sad, sad story. Caleb and Joshua go, No. We can do this. Why? Because what God said. God didn't ask us to decide. He just said, this is what I'm going to give you. Go and have a look at it. But what happened was the 10, the majority were wrong. Okay? The majority were wrong. And 2 million people missed out on their destiny. Isn't that sad? Why? Because of a thought that they allowed to take root. That then produced an action complained and whinged against God. It cost them their destiny. It cost them their future. It's a powerful and a necessary revelation to get. Your life can be ruined by something as intangible as a simple thought. Something as intangible as a simple thought can shipwreck a person's life. Isn't that, that's the power of our thinking. Our thinking is so powerful that Paul, Paul says, renew your mind. In other words, you've come to faith and that's brilliant, but I know enough about you to know that in all those years before you came to Jesus, there was input, there was stuff being said, experiences you had, and your brain was being wired a certain way to think a certain way, respond a certain way, act a certain way. Now you've come to faith. Paul says, that's wonderful, you're saved, but now what you need to do is you need to change the inputs into your brain, change what's going in, change what you are fertilizing, what you're watering, change what you're going to believe, make the choice to believe truth over lies, fact over fiction. He says, you've got to do that. You've got to do that. How many lying thoughts are you entertaining? Think about your life right now. How many lying thoughts do you entertain? What lies are playing around in your mind that are stopping you from making the changes that you probably know you need to make in different areas of your life? What lies are stopping you from enjoying or pursuing deeper, more meaningful relationships with other people around you? What lies are you believing? Oh, they won't like me. They'll think I'm. What lies are stopping you from stepping out into unknown things? What lies are stopping you from trying something new? What lies are stopping you from chasing a dream that maybe God's placed on your heart? Starting a business that God's placed on your heart? What lies are stopping you from actually enjoying simple fellowship with God? Loving Father. What lies stop you from raising your hands in worship? Expressing your heart to the Lord. 
What lines are stopping you from receiving prayer from others? Oh, if they knew this about me, oh. Man, I'd never get a shot. They'd pull away from me. Oh, they'd think I'm dirty. They'd think I'm, oh. So I'll just keep that to myself. What lies are stopping you from enjoying the blessing of being a generous person and giving? Oh, but if I give, I'll have nothing. I'll never. Oh, I can't. I've got to hoard, hoard, hoard. I was brought up that way. This unconscious message to me as I was growing up because we didn't have a lot when I grew up. We had periods of my life where we had no electricity, uh, all kinds of, 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 of stuff that um, just through circumstances and the, the, the family I grew up in, and so unconsciously, I got this message, if you get paid or you get some money or something, you know what you do? You hang on to that as long as you possibly can because you never know when the next dollar is going to come. So you just hold that. You know what that does? It breeds a very stingy person, a very ungenerous heart, a very ungenerous heart that never, ever gets to the point where I'm able to experience when Paul said, you know, Jesus said to me, and when we don't have the recording of when Jesus said to me, Paul says, as the Lord said, he's more blessed to give than to receive. And for years and years, I missed out on that blessing of being more blessed because I was able to give to people. Because of thoughts that I fertilized and watered in my heart about what life would be like if I stepped into that. What lies are you believing that are stopping you from living the life that God wants you to live? What lies do you entertain? What lies are you believing? You know, I, I, I had this, um, I've always had this dream, this desire of going uh, diving. Uh, like getting in the you know, water and scuba gear and, and, and diving, right? And uh, you know why I didn't do it? Now, now, I'll cut to the end of the story. Last year, not this holidays now, the holidays before that, my family bought me a, a ticket. Because I've always said to my boys when they were real little, when you're all older, here's a, a, um, what do you got, a bucket list dream that I have. I want to go shark diving in a cage, in a cage. Now, that was the key phrase, right? In a cage, in a cage. Remember those three words. Do not lose them. I want to go shark diving in a cage with my boys. That's what I want to do. So last year, my kids got together, and, and my wife was a part of it too. And what they did was they bought me a ticket to go diving with sharks. Now, I assumed it was in a cage. That was my assumption, right? Because I've said for years, in a cage. And when I say in a cage, it's always louder and more forceful than the rest of the sentence. I want to go shark diving in a cage. It's said like that, right? I don't want you to miss the inner cage bit. Well, somehow, they missed the inner cage bit. And they said, Dad, we got you a ticket to go diving with sharks up the Sunshine Coast. I assumed it was in a cage until about two days before. And then I realised, what do you mean it's not in a cage? I'm not stupid. In 1975, I think it was, this movie came out. Anyone know where I'm going? And since 1975, nobody wants to go in the water ever again, right? We've got a generation coming up now that don't know about that. If you don't know, don't ask your parents what happened in 1975. Don't ask them. You do not want to know. You do not want to know. I remember being three years old, and I remember going to the old drive-in theatres. Remember the drive-ins, the big screen? And we, and we took the, the speaker and had to put it in the window and wind the window up. Remember when windows had a winder? Anyone? Yep, and we had to wind the window up to clamp it in and sitting in the back of the car with mum and dad there and watching this thing and thinking, wow. <laughs> now, I was too young to really get the full implications. Years later, we end up moving to the coast and I'm surfing and carrying on and so on. Then I moved away from the coast for a period. And when I moved away from the coast, I went to the school library one day and I found a book on sharks. I thought, I really love sharks. So I went and got this book and I'm flicking through it. Then I got another one, another one, another one. Not too long later, I ended up moving back to the coast and I couldn't even put a foot in the water. I had filled my brain with these thoughts. I was convinced that every shark was out there underwater watching, just waiting. That's not Alan. No, leave That's not Al. Let him go. That's not Al. There he is. And I was going to be gone. I convinced myself that every shark in the water was waiting for me. I had a unique flavor, a unique smell, a unique aura, and they knew. And they were going to get me. And so I did not want to go back in the water. It was a real, real struggle. Well, in the end, I did end up going diving. And I did go diving without a cage. And guess what? I'm still here. Who would have guessed? I would not have picked it. I was convinced that I'm going to be that one. I'm going to be that one. Now, here's the reality. Here's, here's the fact. There's about 300 species of sharks. Only 12 species of sharks have ever, ever been recorded as having 
interacted in a bad way with a human being. 12 out of 300 odd species. And out of those 12, there's only three that they would say are known to attack human beings. Right? That's 1%. And here I am thinking that I am going to get attacked the minute I go in the water, but the facts are 1%. Of sharks out there will do any type of harm to human beings. Now, let me give you another statistic, and this might shock you. The chance of getting attacked by a shark in Australian water is one in eight million. One in eight million. But I was convinced that I would be the one in eight million, and so for years I didn't pursue and go and do something that in my heart was always there, a dream to want to get involved in that sport and do that and get underwater and experience what it was like. And so on. All because of a one in eight million chance that something may happen to me. And for years I didn't do it. You want to know another statistic for those who like statistics? You know what else has a one in eight million chance? Of taking you out? A kangaroo. <laughs> True. Exactly same statistics as a shark attack in Australian waters is death by kangaroo. One in eight million. Yet I'll walk through the bush all the time. I see kangaroos, I'll take selfies with them. I'm like, hey, look, kangaroo. We feed these things. Yet they're as lethal as a shark. So we've got to separate fact from fiction. For years, that lie stopped me doing something that I really wanted to do, to experience a part of this world, under that world, to experience a part of God's world, God's creation, the beauty of that. But I convinced myself of something that wasn't true, and it held me back from doing that. So, here's the thing. With 60,000 thoughts entering my mind a day, that's a lot, how do we begin to separate the good from the bad? That which will produce the life of God in you from that which is going to destroy it. Paul gives us a tiny little window, and I'll, I'll, I'll finish up with this. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We got it up there, verse 4 and 5. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. Paul writes this to the Corinthian church. He says, the weapons we fight with... Now, I want you to understand something here in context. This is Paul speaking to the Corinthians. So when Paul says we, he's speaking about himself and his traveling companions. He's going, this is how we do it. He says, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. In other words, he's saying, what we're coming at you, Corinthians, with, when we come into Corinth and we're sharing with you, I want you to understand something. That we're not coming and fighting philosophy with philosophy and, and, and your religious stories with our religious stories. I'm not, we're not coming on that level. He says, we're coming with something divine and more powerful than that. He says, we come to demolish strongholds. He says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of who? Knowledge of God. Anything that sets itself up against the truth of God and the way God sees things and the way God says things are. Anything that sets itself up against that. He says, we're coming against that. We're coming for that stuff. Anything that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every what? Every thought. He says, we take captive every single thought. We take captive. Now, now what he's saying here is, is when we come into Corinth, we preach the gospel. We give people Jesus. We give them the power of God. Right? We're giving that to them. So we're coming against their, their arguments and against all their stuff, not just with worldly wisdom and combating. You know, we're coming with something a little bit more powerful than that. We're coming with divine power. In other words, we're engaging with the Holy Spirit in this process of taking thoughts captive and tearing down arguments. This is not, I'm not talking today saying that the way you overcome those thoughts is just willpower. Because you can't. 60,000 thoughts a day are going to run through your head. This is not a call this morning to say, you just need to be stronger and have more willpower. Now, this is a call to say, hey, we need to take seriously what's going into our minds because it's shaping the way we live our life. It's shaping the way we see the world around us. It's shaping the way you see yourself, shaping the way you see your marriage, shaping the way you manage your money, shaping the way you raise your kids, shaping the way you handle pressure and stress and things in life. It all starts up here. It all starts up here. The Corinthians were following all kinds of gods and bowing to idols and so on. Why? Because thoughts were planted up here. Maybe when they were young, this is the way. Walk in it. This is the true God. 
This is how you've got to serve him. This is how you've got to please him. We lived in India for a number of years. And you see the rituals and the things are gone, but you see little kids from this time, they're being told, this is how it is, this is the truth, this is what it should be, yada, yada, yada. So all this stuff is running around inside their minds. Now Paul says that we, Paul and his companions, we're demolishing the arguments in your minds, Corinthians. We're demolishing it, and we're bringing down those strongholds. They're not doing it themselves, Paul says we're doing that. How are they doing it? By bringing you different bits of information, by giving you different thoughts. Challenging some of the thoughts that have got you to the place where you are now by giving you better thoughts, true thoughts, thoughts that have their basis in the knowledge of God, who God is, who God says you are, what God says about you, what God thinks about you, not the rest of the kids in the playground, not what your parents said when you were growing up, not what your boss might say about you now, what God says about you. He says, we're here telling you what God thinks about you. So we don't replace lies with our own preferred ideas of truth. We replace them with the knowledge of God. We replace them with that which is obedient to Christ. That's what we replace them with. The knowledge of God and that which is obedient to Christ. It's outside of myself. It's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. Have you ever been to a zoo? Anyone ever been to a zoo? Yep. You know one of the great things about a zoo? You've got all these animals that run wild and free, hey? All of a sudden, you've got this tiger. It's sad, really. This, this tiger that should be roaming the African plains is caged up in a thing. I, 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 I love getting up close and being able to look at them, but at the same time, it's kind of sad, isn't it, that these animals aren't. But anyway, I get up nice and close. The only reason I'm able to get up close and look at this thing and stare at this thing and work this thing out is because it's captive. A bit of the mystery is taken away. I'm actually able to see it for what it really is. I see the colours, I see the size, I see the muscles, I see the power in these things. I, had a, I, I, I hated snakes my whole life. I've had a real fear of snakes. I don't like snakes, mainly because in Genesis 1, uh, you know, and I think that that has not changed, you know. I've seen Satan in my backyard so many times. On the odd occasion, if I'm quick enough to... One shall become two flesh. It's just. But I hate snakes. But I had an experience with a snake not too long ago. I, we, we, we'd moved into our place uh, over here, and I went down to the shed one day and opened up the door, and I walked into the, the big shed out the backyard. And in the corner of my eye, I saw something. It was just like this big thing curled up in a circle. And you know when you see something, but you think, if I don't acknowledge I've seen it, it's not real. <laughs> it's not real. So I did that. I went, oh, I just, yeah, it's not real. And I thought, no, this is dumb, Alan. That's your shed. That snake don't own that shed. You own that shed. Be the man. Stand up to it. So I did. I turned around. I walked back and I sort of got a distance away and I pulled up a box and I sat down and I stared at the snake and the snake just turned. And he's staring back at me. My heart's going, run, you're dead. He's going to get you. Because snakes are after me just like sharks were. They've got one agenda. It's in their DNA. Find Alan and destroy. But I sat there and I stared at this snake. And, and, and an amazing thing happened as I sat there and stared at this snake. Amazing thing, I felt it physically in my body. I sat there for about five to ten minutes looking at it, and it's just looking at me, flicking its tongue. After about five to ten minutes, I literally felt this peace just fell on me. And I realized, you're actually not out to get me. It sounds really stupid, but it was such a real experience to me. I realized that you're not trying to harm me. I don't like you. We're not going to be best mates. You're not coming around to my house for, you know. But you're not out to get me. You're not out to hurt me. As I sat there and I stared down that snake, I realized that it wasn't going to get me. And sometimes that's what we need to do. We need to take time to stop and to stare down some of the lights. I think that's what Paul, I think that's what Paul was getting at. Take every thought captive, because once it's captive you get a chance to truly look at it in the light of truth. You get to really look at it. Is that really true or is that a lie? Where's that coming from? Is that what God says? Is that just what I think? Is that just what I was told? We take every thought captive. And if it doesn't come, line itself up with obedience to Christ, then we don't believe it. We don't give that lie power to dictate the next step that we take in our life or the next decision that we make. 
You're going to either take your thoughts captive or your thoughts are going to take you captive. It's your call. It's your decision. There's an old Chinese proverb. It goes like this. You cannot stop a bird from landing on your head, but you can stop it making a nest in your hair. You can't stop a lot of those 60,000 thoughts that are going to flood through your head today. You can't stop them. They're going to come from all kinds of angles, all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of things. But you can stop them taking root by fertilizing and watering and so on, giving them fertile soil to grow. Because if you sow a thought, you reap an action and eventually you're going to reap a destiny. Let me just ask you a couple of questions while we finish up. I want us, to, I want us to, to stand in a second. We're going to finish up with that first song. I love that, that uh, first song. The very base truth that all of us should understand is this, I belong to you. Amen? I belong to you. So I've asked the guys, they're going to lead us in that. We're going to, we're going to finish with that song. But let me ask you a couple of questions right now. How powerful do you think your thoughts are? What have they stopped you doing that you wish you'd done? What has been stopped? What have you stopped doing? What have you not done just because of a thought? What have they made you do that in hindsight you wish you'd never done? What do you want to do right now that you're being held back from by a simple, unchallenged, free-roaming thought that you now know needs to be taken captive? What are you believing that's holding you back from trying? What are you entertaining that's keeping you from deeper relationships with other people that are stopping you from embracing and enjoying the life God has for you down here? And to some of you in this room, what lie are you listening to that's keeping you from embracing faith in Jesus and running after everything he has for you? What lie are you believing that's stopping you from accepting Jesus Christ into your heart, surrendering your life to him, embracing faith in him, and trusting him for the rest of your days? We always think we've got tomorrow, but it's just a thought too. We don't know. What I do know is this. When I stand before God, there's a point in my life where I knew God would say to me, you're without excuse. You heard the gospel. You knew what I did for you. You You knew that my son died died for you. You knew I loved you. But you didn't make the decision to follow me. If you're here this morning, I'm not going to put the hand in the air thing. I've seen too many people put their hand in the air in an emotional moment and walk away and not follow Jesus. It means nothing. But I am going to challenge you. If you're here today and you've never made that decision to follow Jesus Christ, I want you to think seriously about the claims of Jesus. And I want you to realize that once you know the story of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, once you know what he did for you, that historical fact, that historical reality, you have knowledge. and You're accountable with that knowledge. At some point, you're going to make a decision. Are you going to follow after him? Are you going to surrender around plans and purposes for your life? Are you going to go humbly before him and say, you know what, God, I am a sinner. I played a role in Jesus being on that cross. But God, I thank you that you died for me. The punishment you went through on that cross, I deserve that, God. But thank you, you love me so much, you took it for me. You died for me. You took the death I deserve so I can have the life that you deserved. And when I depart from this world, I'll get to spend eternity with him. This life is a drop in the bucket. It's a crack in the wall. Seems like forever when we're this side of it. One day we're going to be the other side. And eternity, if eternity means what eternity means, it's going to be a lot longer than this tiny bit of space we have down here. Amen? So choose wisely. Choose wisely. Father, I want to thank you for your word this morning. God, I want to thank you. Father, that you love us. I want to thank you that we belong to you. I want to thank you that you have good plans and good purposes for us, God. And Father, I do pray for those people that are sitting here this morning, Lord, that are uh, back and forthing with their faith and not quite sure whether they want to dive in. I pray, Holy Spirit, would you speak to their hearts and would you draw them to the heart of the Father? Would you draw them to the love of the Father this morning? And for the rest of us, God, Father, I pray, Holy Spirit, would you continue to challenge us, God? Our thinking is such an important part of who we are. And maybe some of us haven't thought much about that. But God, I pray that as we leave this place this morning, we wouldn't just get on with lunch and get on with life. I pray that we would think about your word, renew your mind, be transformed by renewing your mind. I pray, Holy Spirit, would you take us on a journey? Take us on a journey. 
Transform us by your word in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen.